Hi, and welcome back to U.S. History with me, Mr. Snyder. And today we are beginning Chapter 4, and we are getting into industry and big business and different technology and basically the speeding up of the Industrial Revolution. And so let's go ahead and get started. Your learning targets for today are to analyze what factors exactly led to the industrialization of the U.S. Uh, during the late 1800s after the Civil War. We're going to explain how these new inventions changed Americans' lives, and we'll discuss how industrialization impacted America. So we're going to learn about the causes, the effects, and the middle. So let's go ahead and get started. Five causes of industrialization. Let's talk about each one. The Civil War. Basically, whenever you have a war, technology and production speeds up. And we've seen this after the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, and especially our recent wars in the Persian Gulf. But it encourages production uh, techniques to be improved, the innovation of certain things and to improve them. And during the Civil War, it also caused us to expand our railroads. Uh, our, the second factor is natural resources. We have a lot of natural resources that we can use to turn into other products and to ship to other places. We have a lot of natural resources that a lot of other countries don't. Our growing labor supply. Next unit, we're going to talk about the in, uh, immigration into the United States during this time, but millions of immigrants are coming every year. And so we have these immigrants who are willing to work for a lower wage, and so growing labor supply. Technology and innovation, new business practices, which we'll get into next time, along with the new technology we're going to talk about right now, spur the growth. And lastly, the government policies, laissez-faire government policies, which means hands-off, we're going to let business do whatever they want, and we're not going to interfere too much. That encourages investment in new business and technology. So you put those five together, we have industrialization. And two factors help fuel the country's growth during this time. And it's a vast supply, again, of the natural resources that other countries don't have and a huge workforce available to us. Two new types of businesses. Um, not businesses, not a new type, but two types of business order uh, show themselves in the United States during this time, and that is capitalism as opposed to communism or socialism. Capitalism is an economy where businesses are privately owned. So me, myself, and I, we could go start a business and offer a service or a good to people, and that would be allowed. That is a capitalism. And if I did that, I would be uh, known as an entrepreneur. Go ahead and say that out loud with me. Entrepreneur. Uh, a lot of people say that incorrectly, so I want you to practice. Entrepreneur. Those are people who invest money in a product in order to make that product. They invest their own time, energy, and resources into that product in order to provide a good and better their own lives. So entrepreneurs encouraged industrialization during this time. The government actually tries to help during this time. Um, th their policies encourage industrialization. They enact something called a protective tariff, which we've talked about before, kind of upset the South in 1830 or so. Uh, taxes on an imported good that make it cheaper to produce or to buy a good that was produced locally. And so that encourages people to buy American, so to speak, and um, give the money back to people in America and not send it overseas to somebody who made a foreign product. And then the government encouraged what is called laissez-faire, and that's literally translates to hands off. Hands off. We're not going to mess with this. We're not going to regulate business during this time. And that is good for some people, but it's also bad for the workforce. And we'll get into that um, here pretty soon. Inventions during this time. Patent applications skyrocket during this period. And a patent is something that's actually in the Constitution that gives the government the right to 
grant patents. And it's basically a protection for an inventor. And he invents his invention. What's to prevent another person from coming and stealing that idea and making money off it? That's basically taking money out of that guy's pocket. He's not even going to take the time to invent that then. And so this encourages production, encourages innovation, because you can get a patent for your idea. And that gives you the right to develop, use, and sell that invention for a set period of time. And that period of time uh, varies depending on what the invention is. Thomas Edison, for example, the great inventor, received more than 1,000 patents for his inventions. And here are some inventions during this time. Edison goes ahead and invents the incandescent light bulb that we all knew until a couple years ago when we started using the newer CFL light bulbs. It basically remained unchanged since Edison had invented it. So great invention that all of us have used. Westinghouse, George Westinghouse, invents a way to send electricity over long distances using uh, a primitive sort of transformer. And so this was now we're able to begin powering our homes and our factories due to his invention. Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone. So we had the telegraph before we were able to code using Morse code. Um, distances over, or sorry, messages <laughs> over long distances, but now we can actually use our voices to talk to each other over long distances. And Bessemer, one of the most important inventions during this time, is the Bessemer process. It basically heats iron to a very, very, very high temperature to melt off all the impurities and create stronger, lighter weight steel. And that allows us to build newer inventions like skyscrapers uh, and suspension bridges. Before that, you couldn't build a building over like three stories or so because it, would, it, it wasn't strong enough. And so now this steel allows us to build skyscrapers and suspension bridges like the Golden Gate Gr Bridge, for example, is a uh, suspension bridge. Roadway suspended by steel cables. More than any other factor during this time, railroads are the growth factor in industrialization. They are the biggest one. They transport all the goods and inventions that we make quickly, cheaply, and efficiently. Um, this creates cities along these railroads, most like the Transcontinental Railroad, and greatly influences the physical and economic makeup of others. Chicago, for example, becomes our nation's rail hub because stuff is coming in from the south and the west, and it's being shipped off to the east. So Chicago becomes a major city during this point. And basically, we have every city during this time has its own time and so that made it very hard to coordinate between uh, cities as to when train schedules were going to, uh, trains were going to come into the station. So we decide to divide up the globe, actually, during this time. The globe is not divided up into 24 time zones to help keep these train schedules. And we have the Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific times here in the United States. It becomes better on railroads because of inventions and innovation. Automatic couplers, which uh, hook the trains together. Air brakes and refrigerator cars allow us to ship meat and it remains cold and preserves longer. Dining cars, heating cars, and the Pullman sleeping car make it much more comfortable to um, sleep and travel during this time for passengers. They build lavish depots like New York's Grand Central Station and Union Depot and later Union Station in Chicago. And Fort Wayne actually becomes a major rail hub during this time between Chicago and Pittsburgh. A lot of that is torn down, but they still have the old train station downtown. It's very beautiful and it's a great landmark here in Fort Wayne. And now even today, they're planning on making Fort Wayne one of the hubs for a new high-speed rail system that the government is investing in. So that's a little history on railroads. To meet this growing demand for new stuff, we have to figure out how to make stuff better. And so factory owners create something called mass production, which is building things on a massive scale. It makes these products quickly and inexpensively 
and it depends more on machinery to do this than something that was done by hand before. So what are the effects of industrialization? And make sure you put this in learning target three. The U.S. becomes the leading exporter in the world. Today we're the leading importer, but back then we were the leading exporter. We make it easy to send finished uh, products to ports on the water where they could be shipped out to other countries. We start to become a world economic power during this time, and we tie ourselves to other nations uh, through trade. It also changes our domestic way of life because we begin uh, using more machines on farms, and that is more efficient, and it puts a lot of farmers out of work, and farmers who are out of work begin moving to the city. So this starts to transition our life from rural to urban, and a lot of people are moving into the cities, immigrants included, in a process known as urbanization. So let's wrap up here. Here's a little uh, graph for you. Kind of if you want to pause this and read through it, kind of a wrap up uh, everything we talked about. So let's review our two main definitions here. What is a patent? Go ahead and pause. Try to say it out loud to yourself. What is capitalism? Try to say it out loud to yourself. A patent is a grant by the federal government that gives, it protects the inventor, gives him the right to develop, use, and sell his invention for a set period of time. And capitalism is basically an economy where it's set up that businesses are privately owned by you and me and other people like us. So that is an overview of industrialization during the late 1800s, and I'll see you later.